listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Our producer, Elliot Bowman, with us on the ones and twos. And Michael, here that, we are is, together, is that man. Desk over there where the ones and <laughs> That's twos the ones and twos. I mean, look how many chords there are. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> like, God, you know I what I mean? I know. It's got a big one, twos, and threes. <laughs> It's a fantastic setup, though, it's, on it's Radio impressive. Row. It's impressive. Shout yeah. out to our crew for getting this whole thing yeah. done. I mean, our guy Elliot obviously with us. We got Nick, Dez, Dez Ken, Ken, Miles, Ryan, Jeremy was hanging around here somewhere, Brian Rogers. The whole crew here for VEASAN it is. is out here. Yeah, in full force. The Army is out. Yeah, and, that's and, awesome. And you're out here. How's Vegas been treating you so you far know, for Super this Bowl This weather week? is unbelievable. Every time I come to Vegas, <laughs> it must be me. Like, it's raining and it's cold. Like, it's, like, ridiculous. Like, like Jesus, I spent two months here. I froze my ass off. I wanted to get back to New Jersey. <laughs> I think it's that New Jersey in me, Femi. I really do. But anyway, it's good to be here. Good to see you. Yes. It's really good. And what a great week we're going to have. Super Bowl. Have you turned in your picks yet? I have not turned in my picks. I'm doing that later on after the show. I'm going to send mine in. We have the VEASAN Super Bowl betting guide. We'll have to get those in. I, Five o'clock is our deadline. I, I know. I know. And I'm like every time I type it up to send it in, I just change it. I type it up. I change it. I type it up. I change it. Like I, I have no conviction. And it's Monday before the game. I you know, I, have a, I want the 49ers, but I, you know, I mean, I, that's a fan in me because yeah. I started my career there. But, you know, anyway, I, it's, it's a hard game to handicap because there's no evidence that if you're saying you love the Niners, you're saying it's all regular season. There's no postseason mm-hmm. evidence. Well, speaking of the Niners, I mean, you brought your 49ers Super Bowl ring with you. I got it. Look re- at show that baby that off there. Boy, that was the first one. Yeah, that's the first one. That's the pride and joy right there. That was one that I just... Drove Bill Walsh around to get that one. I picked up his dry cleaning. I earned that. Well, I earned that at the dry cleaner and I earned at the San Francisco airport. But that was a great memory. I mean, that was when the Super Bowl was really, it was played at Stanford Stadium and we played Miami. It was an interesting game because Miami was trying to substitute to get their nickel defense on the field. This is before the age of substitution mm-hmm. and specialization. And they tried to play, We and then they tried to keep us from doing that. And so they try to play tempo, and then we eventually just settled it down and, and took over the game. Dan Marino's last time he ever went to a Super Bowl. Imagine Great. That. Uh, the scene in the locker room is, you know, as a young kid, I'm 24 years old, Stanford Stadium. I mean, there's more people than, than live in my hometown was in that stadium. And, you know, when I see Bill Walsh in his press, je- press pants and his white sweater, and he just takes a nap on the floor in the locker room, and I thought to myself, God, you are the luckiest son of a bitch in the world to be for a son of a barber and to be here, you know, it's like, holy shit. It's a moment I'll never forget, you know. And then, you know, you, 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 these owners in the league, it's amazing. So I'm, we had a before party, and my mom and dad came out for it. I wasn't married at the time. Millie was, she didn't come out. She, we, she, was, uh, doing, she was an accountant, so she was doing mm-hmm. work. So I'm at the before party, and I'm just standing there with my parents and, the Bartolo walks over to me and he says, where are your tickets? Because there was no place to sit in the press box, right? This is mm-hmm. the old Stanford Stadium. And I said, oh, Mr. D, here are my tickets. And he grabs the three tickets out of my hand and he says, here, you sit here. And he put my ass right on the 50-yard line. Like, it wow. was, like, unbelievable at the generosity of the man. And that's just kind of the way he was. It really was. That, that was a special time in the NFL, and he was a special owner, tr- truly. I think everything about him was unique he was demanding but yet he was uh he was really a, a remarkable person in terms of how the interconnection between the, mm-hmm. the staff because you got to remember in 84 we were in this little dumpy building 7-eleven nevada street like we wow. had no we had no draft room we had to turn the classrooms into draft room you know it was like there was no but there weren't that many people in an organization today you can invade normandy with oh the amount gosh. of people in the in the damn thing i mean the, the facilities today are just state-of-the-art everything and all that but like you mentioned DeBartolo, like like the 49ers being a Bay Area team, big market, like that their their family and what they've been able to do for the success of that yeah. franchise, and now you spin it forward to today where they're once again in the Super Bowl. Like they're one of the pillars of the league, yeah, if no. not for their family. And, and really, and you know, Al Davis has a kind of a connection to this game as well. Having been with the Raiders here, Al Davis was the one who brokered the deal between the DeBarlo family and the the family that owned the 49ers before. He actually got a founder's fee for making that deal. Wow. And then that's when Mr. DeBarlo Sr. was still alive, and then that's when he, the, Eddie took over the team. And then Eddie did what most owners do, like we're seeing now in the league, is he made a mistake. He hired, he hired a general manager to, to Joe Thomas to run the team, and Joe Thomas then trades for OJ and gives up all these draft choices and all that and destroys the team. And then finally 
Eddie comes to his senses and says, okay, here's what I want to do. And Jed York had that moment too, right? Remember when Jed York, you know, he hired Jim. That was a great hire. Mm-hmm. Jim turns the franchise around. Just, just, then then Balky comes in. Then Balky's there. They kind of let Jim go. Balky and Jim don't get along. And then, you know, he goes through Thomas Sula, Chip Kelly, and then he gets it right with Kyle. So it's kind of like there's always a learning experience for the owners, and you just they don't seem to think they need it, but they do. And that's what Kraft said at his press conference. He said, I learned a lot. Yeah, And Robert Kraft, obviously the Patriots, they've been able to have a number of success. Obviously today, seven-year anniversary oh, wow. of 28-3 to against the Atlanta. I know Falcons fans, they don't want to hear about it because it's uh, well, one fine. of the day. The but Falcons fans are fine. they got that front office. They're good. They're dialed in. they, they got, got Rich McKay running things. They're gonna, they, they won 21 games in the last three years. What do they care? <laughs> they got this thing turned around. I mean, who wouldn't, you know? I mean, I don't know I mean, why. I'm in full. So, but they've been drafting <laughs> offensive skill players. They can't make an explosive play, but why? You know? Who cares? Desmond Ritter, they don't want Lamar Jackson. They don't want Bill Belichick. I mean, why wouldn't they go with it? I mean, yeah. isn't it the greatest thing ever? The coach they lose in the Super Bowl, chance to hire him you know what we're good no we're why good. would we want him we're they good. lost Kyle when they lost Kyle Shanahan they lost everything out in Atlanta I mean Dan Quinn that's why the Dan Quinn we'll talk about it in another block the Dan Quinn hire the 28 to 3 game is fascinating because we truly believed in that game going in that you know we were going to move the ball successfully and that we knew they were a good offense but we thought we would get a lead and add to the lead we kind of thought it would be an over game I didn't know anything about that yeah and we practiced on Thursday and Friday we had two periods of of two-point plays because we felt like we were going to have to extend the game to a three-point score because Belichick, unlike Dan Campbell, doesn't mind a three-point score, a three-score lead. You know, he doesn't mind that, although he's old school when he's out yeah, of touch, right? He's he's, touch. We, we understand Lost that. Lost his fastball. Lost his fastball. We understand that. But, uh, you know, and so that came in handy when we came back, and I was just watching the final drive. I mean, there's a third and ten play. Brady, you know, Brady hits the auto route to – to Julian that keeps that drive alive. And then the next thing you know, Julian makes that great catch over. Uh, no, it was to Chris Hogan. It was to Chris Hogan over the left sideline. So, you know, what a great memory. I mean, that was one of those where, as Belichick often will say, they were in the lead, but they weren't in control. And there was a lot of things that, you know, Kyle gets blamed for that game. But at the end of the day, Dan Quinn is the head coach has to step in and say, hey, here's what we got to do. Yeah, and now Dan Quinn's going to be the head coach of the Washington Commanders. We'll get into all of that here. But as we set the table here for Super Bowl week, we'll give our our full predictions on Thursday. Maybe we'll do some props on Thursday podcast as well. But, I mean, everyone's been looking around and said, hey, would you ever have imagined Mm. a Super Bowl in Las Vegas, Nevada, 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, would you have imagined? I mean, behind us at our drafting set, there's an NFL slot machine here on Radio Row. Like, this is incredible to turn around and and how everyone's kind of been invested in what we're doing here from the betting side of it and now connecting it with the National Football League, the sport we love. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's awesome. really awesome. I mean, the fact that, that, that we that people have grown up, that we've become mature about yeah. the betting world. I mean, it's in Europe all over the place, right? So why can't it be? You know, and I think it's awesome. And what a great venue. I mean, there's what this is a party town. This is the biggest party. Although next year, I got to say, oh. I am so looking forward to New Orleans. Because in New Orleans, you don't, have to, you don't have to drive anywhere. You can just mm-hmm. walk everywhere. Now, the streets are packed, but it's to me, that's the best place. New Orleans has always been on the bucket list of cities mm-hmm. to go to. Super Bowl uh, 59 next year out there at the Superdome. But in ter- terms of the betting for this game between the Niners and the Chiefs, we'll obviously talk about this all throughout the week. But right now, San Francisco is a two-point favorite yeah. over at our show sponsor, DraftKings. 47 and a half is our total. It's where we've been sitting for much of the weekend. But we've seen some places go to two and a half to where maybe some of the respected betters are valuing the regular season and the totality of this thing versus what we've seen over the last handful of weeks. Yeah, no, it's, it's a reverse line movement. Nobody's yeah. really betting the Niners, although the professionals are, and it's moving the line away from the Chiefs, that line open. I, I love how we send out the Bill AD email, and, mm-hmm. and I see people put their picks at the Chiefs at three. I never saw the three. Like, I don't know where they invented that number. They're like Russo. They come up with numbers I've never seen before. I mean, I don't know where they get these things. They just pull I, them out of his hat. It's I like a magician. That, oh, I got a three here with the Chiefs. If there was a three, it couldn't have been more than two seconds, it, right? Yeah. There, there's, there's no way that many people there's got no it. No <laughs> there's no way. That's what I, I never saw that's it. That's what hey, I love yeah. about the bet. I love this about the betting community. They can't wait to promote their wins, but they never talk about their losses. And if, they, if you lost, they always had a half point more. That's why they did it. they pushed or something yeah. like that. There's like they're undefeated. Like or it's, it's, or it's variance. Variance is why we lost. You know they're <laughs> undefeated. It's so good. Like I, I'll be the first to tell you I screwed it up. But yeah, I, I for me it's been really hard to get my hands around. Like what evidence do I have that the 49ers are going to be better on defense? Like this front, which they've put a lot of money into, has not played well 
against two really good offensive lines in Green Bay, which can pass protect, and Detroit, which is a very good line, right? Detroit can run and block, and, and Green Bay ran block very well. Aaron Jones was able to be very effective. I mean, they're giving up 5.6 yards per carry in the playoffs, and they only gave up 4.1 in the regular season. They, they've they allowed five rushing touchdowns in the postseason. They only allowed 10 during the regular season. So, like, to me, there's no evidence to say that I know they're in an eight-man front, and that's all everybody wants to hear about. Well, they're in an eight-man front. They're in an eight-man front. That stops the run. Well, then, if it stops the run, why are people running the ball? You know, it's just like it's the worst yeah. thing of all. Oh, we're in an eight-man front. Well, you got to have to defend the gaps in an eight-man front. So that's where I'm having a hard time on Monday as I continue down this week, and I can't. That's like I said earlier. I can't make them. I'm having a hard time turning it into Adam Burke. And right now, we're seeing some of the betters capitalize on what you're talking about with that 49ers run defense. The fifth most bet player prop, Isaiah Pacheco over rushing yards. And well, it makes sense, right? Half. So Pacheco's average during the regular season 14 carries a game. Okay, in the postseason, he's up to 21. So Andy's called seven. Now, nobody likes to call. Randy hates calling runs, let's face it, but he hates losing more than calling runs. Yeah. So he's changed his whole demeanor. And those seven carries are going to be, and if he breaks one long one, which he's capable of, look, I, I think there's no question they miss, you know, the safety, that they, they miss their tackle. They don't tackle San Francisco. If you watch the Lions game and you watch the, the Packer game, their tackling is not the same as it was last year. I mean, they were a better tackling team. And I think, Femi, the key to the game is going to be the script. I think the 49ers must defeat the script. And that takes, and we'll talk about it in the coordinator matchup, that takes anticipating what Andy's going to do and then reacting to it. Yeah, because the Chiefs, they've been able to at least get out to some of these leads here or at least kind of have a, a rhythm offensively early on in these games. If they can go ahead and do that, Kansas City's offense has not shown up in the second half of these games here, especially no. last week where they they didn't even score against the right. Baltimore Ravens last week, but they were able to hang on to that victory. So. I mean, actually, they don't score and they want a game. I mean, think about that. I, and that's I mean, remarkable. I think they had th three first downs, I want to say, in yeah. the second half. Unbelievable. <laughs> it just goes to show you what Baltimore was doing offensively yeah. with that game. But I'm sure Ravens fans want to go ahead and turn that page and close that book and head to 2024. But we are here kicking off Super Bowl week. GM Shuffle live from Las Vegas. We'll get into some of the NFL news and notes on the other side, but don't go away, though. This is thing getting warmed up here on the DraftKings Network. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. All right, Dan Quinn is now the new man in Washington as the head coach here. And we talked about it a little bit during the podcast last week. The news broke while we were yeah. recording. But to kind of talk more about this hiring and how it became Dan Quinn versus what a lot of people thought would be Ben Johnson, who ends up staying in Detroit. Well, I, I think that what the Niners, well, excuse me, what the Washington commanders have really wanted to do is they wanted to build an organization that's around their general manager. It's Adam Peters centric. That was their key hire. And so they wanted somebody who would, you know, fill in and coach the team, be involved, but not be involved in the whole thing. And so they were not offering six-year deals to coaches. They were offering four-year deals. And if you're Ben Johnson and you're taking over a downtrodden team like Washington, you know, and you're going to pass on that six-year deal. You know, now people said he was asking for a lot of money. I'm sure he probably was. I mean, he feels like he can go back to Detroit. You know, the market's paying a lot of money now, now, now for coaches, and people are handing out six-year deals because of the instability that goes into it. Now, not saying they can't fire you after two years. I mean, Josh McDaniels had a six-year deal. Yeah. He got his butt fired. Matt Rule had a big deal. Yeah, Matt Rule had a seven-year deal. He got his butt fired. So it's like it doesn't mean you're not going to fire you. It just means that you have a lot of money coming to you. And I don't think Ben Johnson wanted to risk it. Where Dan Quinn, you know, Dan Quinn was really the – the candidate that gave them what I think gives them something to uh, that they wanted. They wanted somebody with a positivity that's going to walk in the building, that's going to lift them up, that's never going to be down, that's going to generate a lot of uh, a kumbaya. You know, they're all going to go to Dairy Queen after the game. You know, all that stuff. Have so RC colas. A, exactly. Yeah. I, I don't say that in a derogatory way yeah. against Dan. Dan's really that's what Dan does really well. So, and it fits with Peters, and it gives Peters the spotlight to build the team the way he wants to build the team. And it's going to be interesting how he does build the team because he does in San Francisco, the defense that they built there was predicated on the defensive front. 
and it was predicated on the Pete Carroll system of defense. Remember, it goes from Sala to D'Amico to Wilkes, but the intertwining of the defense is all predicated on the front, one gap up the field, and that's what Quinn wants to run. That's what he ran in Dallas. So for Peters, you're getting a guy that you're familiar with and you understand the dynamics of it all. And I think to me, for Ben Johnson, it probably wasn't the right job for him to take. And so with the years, it gives Cam, it gives Quinn two years to figure out if he can turn this thing around. There's been so much on the Ben Johnson front of this whole thing to where like the, the money was discussed. You, we've talked about the years on this podcast. Some people have said that he maybe didn't interview as well. Mm-hmm. Is that what you're hearing? Like, like I guess what what out there should we be taking at face value? What out there is just kind of fodder? Like, like what is the what is the actual straight and narrow on this Ben Johnson? You know, thing? last year when he interviewed, I was told reliably that he was not ready. He wasn't really ready. And who could be at 36? I mean, nobody's ready at 36, right? Even if they get the job, they're not ready. Dave Canales isn't ready, right? I mean, some of these guys that get the job, I mean, Brian Callahan's not ready. Now, fortunately, Brian's going to bring his dad with him to be the O-line coach, which helps him. But no, none of us are ready at 36, right? We all think we are, but we're really not. And so I, I was told he really wasn't ready for that. But now... You know, I mean, his personality is such, you got to understand that he's a very, he's from the Adam Gase school, mm. right? That Adam Gase is who developed him. And he doesn't project that kind of, oh my God, alpha male type leadership. He's got Campbell to do that for him. So he's very cerebral. He's very intelligent. He kind of does his own game planning by himself. He's not, for lack of a better term, because we love this term in the NFL, he's not collaborative in terms of the game plan, right? And yeah. so... I think it just didn't fit for him. And he'll find some place that maybe it does, but I, I, I don't see it. It wasn't in Washington. And you can say, well, they settled for Quinn. Quinn gives them an opportunity to build. I, if Quinn doesn't work, like this isn't going to be Peters gets fired and Quinn gets fired. Like they're not joined at the hip. It's Peters' show, and he's going to evaluate Quinn. And after two years, if Quinn isn't the guy, then they're going to find another coach. Like they they did not want to – they want to build around Peters. They see something in Peters that obviously they think is a home run. So is Peters more in charge of the hiring of Cliff Kingsbury, or is that more Dan Quinn? I would say it's probably uh, uh, both, you know. Okay. I think the Kingsbury hire is, look, look, we've got to figure out. You know, one thing I think Dan Quinn knows more than anything is his success in Atlanta was due to having the right guy coach the offense. Remember, he got Kyle Shanahan to leave Cleveland. Yeah. That big fight in Cleveland, and he got Kyle to come out of there and get there. And so that helped him. And then when he was didn't have Kyle, he wasn't the same coach, right? You know, he had Sark as his off, yeah. offensive coordinator. So I, I think that was probably the right thing. And, you know, Cliff was close to doing a deal with the Raiders. I'm told reliably that that, that broke down in the contract. That something happened on the Raiders front that broke that thing down. I, initially, I thought it was... The Raiders were going to bring somebody in that Cliff didn't want, but they actually let Kennedy Polo go, the running back coach, to kind of clear the deck for Cliff to bring in some people he wanted. And then the 49, and then the Raiders had it broken down. Telesco tried to get involved later on the deal, and it didn't work out. So now they have Luke Getze to come in, which is a fascinating, fascinating hire for the Raiders. Yeah, I want to get into that, but I do want to ask you a follow up on Cliff with the Raiders. When you mean breakdown, does this all come back to the money, or is this something? Like, I guess, philosophically, that was a breakdown? Because the reports out there was that they agreed to terms, but nothing ever, of course, was signed. Well, but a lot of it comes down to the language in the contract. And, you know, who's doing the contract? Who's kind of trying to mess with the language to protect the team? And, you know, and you've got to be very careful because I think Cliff is still getting paid by the Cardinals. Remember, Cliff did a deal with the Cardinals. He did got an extension. He and Kime and all those and guys. Kyler. And, they, and Kyler. They all got money. I mean, you know. Shout out Eric Burkhardt. I mean, it, it don't, you know, as I say many times, you don't have to win in the NFL to get rewarded, right? So he got, uh, he got, a, so that was the, it was all the offset stuff. So I don't know the whole, I don't know the, the, uh, the technicalities, but I know it was on the Raider end. Telesco, the new GM, tried to get involved, didn't. And once that opened the door for Quinn to hire him, he did. So Cliff recently was at USC. The quarterback of USC, Caleb Williams, a lot of people think is going to go yeah. number one overall. Commanders pick second overall. People are starting to kind of tie the two and two together. So not as, as similar as it was yeah. when Cliff took the Cardinal job and they took Kyler, but people obviously know the background of the quarterbacks and who Ka- yeah, Caleb Williams played for. Is, is there something that we should read into that where the no, Commanders No, I, I mean, one thing we, we love to draw straight lines from one thing to the next, yeah. right? We love to do that. That's how our brains work. That's how our brains work. So, like, okay, let's start, let's start with this one first, okay? It, Getsy's now the Raider offensive coordinator. Okay. Now, 
Telesco has valuable information because he can watch all the tape on Justin Fields and make up his own mind. And then he can go talk to Getze and find out the real deal because we see what we see on the tape and then Getze has an opinion. Now, you could say, well, maybe Getze's not right about his opinion. Okay, the guy was around him for two years. I think he probably knows the guy's strengths and weaknesses, right? So uh, if the Raiders aren't interested in Fields Mm. in a trade, that tells the rest of the league what they need to know without knowing, okay? As for Washington, Quinn and and Peters are running the program. I'm sure they're going to ask Cliff a lot about Caleb, but they're also going to make sure they know May, they know Penix, they know all the other ones because, remember, he's going to rebuild the team. I don't think he's interested in giving away assets, for one, unless he really believes that this guy is all becoming, Mm -hmm. right? I don't think – I think that's the case. So – Cliff isn't going to have, he's going to have impact. He's going to be a piece of the decision, but it's not going to be his decision, right? Mm-hmm. We know Peters, when he was in San Francisco, he wanted Trey Lance, and he, you know, he politicked, and he and Lynch, they got that done, yeah. even though we know how that all went. But to me, I think this will be, this will be Peters' decision with Quinn's input, with the staff's input, but I think it'll all be based on that. And if he trades up, it'll be because he doesn't value the other guys behind him. But why would you trade up? Why would you give away assets if you think you have the same grade on both players? Yeah, no, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. The, the, the one to watch, though, and uh, the one to watch is from whatever date today is, February the 5th mm-hmm. forward, is what, what they think, what Getsy thinks of Fields. And you know damn well, Eberflus knows it, right? Mm-hmm. Ryan Poles knows it. So, you know, when he calls Telesco on the phone to say, hey, we're interested in trading fields because we're going to use this pick, he's going to know what they are. Now, what we'll see is we'll, we'll see in the media that the Raiders are really interested. That'll be the play from the media so that it generates, it gives them a chance to have more authority, more chance to talk about, to give them a better chance to make a better deal. Yeah, I think it's so fascinating this now gets the, side of the thing that he's now involved like, he's not the guys that's making the trade call but he at least has a lot of input on terms of what well, the people are going to follow him people, people don't want to make up their own they want to use his information yeah. and so the, the the bears know this right and so they're going to put it out that they're in heavy battle yep. the raiders are really they're going all, all hands on deck and unless the raiders do what what the the atlanta falcons made a living doing is announce that they're not interested in a player then that you know that's going <laughs> to stop that that's that's one I'll never be able to get over. We're not interested. <laughs> we took a billboard out right on the uh, right in downtown Atlanta. We would not want Lamar Jackson yeah. under no circumstances. Commanders were in that boat as well, yeah. saying, "Hey, we're, we don't want we don't him. want and, Belichick." And now you're picking yeah. second overall. Yeah, okay. <laughs> look how that worked out. Uh, our guy Harbaugh with the, with the Chargers. He was introduced earlier last week. He's now bringing Greg Roman in as the OC. These two obviously worked together in San Francisco with Colin Kaepernick and the success that they had going to three straight NFC title games. Roman is a name that we haven't heard from quite a bit in a, in a mm. while here. He was the OC in Baltimore last year. They bring in Monken. How do you see this fit together with Justin Herbert? A little bit different of a quarterback. Well, you know Roman they're going to run the ball, right? They're, they're going <laughs> to run it. Maybe Herbert's going to run the ball as no, well. No, I don't think they're going to run Herbert, but I think they're going to run the ball. I think you're going to see a more conventional offense. I, I mean, I was watching the 49ers game with the uh, comeback from behind in Dallas. I mean, the two backs, the stuff that they were running. It, it, it's going to come back in vogue. I could see them zigging while everybody else is zagging. Look, he's going to have to have somebody in there to help him. And obviously, Jim, being a good coach, is going to develop, is get that pro passing game going. Because I can't see them being in shotgun the whole game. I just can't. He's going to be under center. This kid's too good. He's going to be under center. And Roman's going to have to develop himself as a coach, too. We always sit here and say, the players have to get better. The players have to get better. Well, we all got to get better, right? We have yep. to get better in personnel. We got to get better in coaching. We got to get better with players. I think Roman's got to get better in the passing game. Yeah, because that's the was the knock on the Ravens' passing offense mm-hmm. from years past there, and it was kind of this year was a, a, almost humbling for Greg yeah. Roman because everybody was praising Todd Monken left and right and what they had done, and Lamar Jackson's going to win another MVP. One one with Greg Roman now wins one with Todd Monken, so we'll see what Roman has cooked up here for 2024 with the Los Angeles Chargers, a team that we like a lot heading into next year. I mean, how could you not with well, Jim Harbaugh? You know, he's, he's going to give coach. them that toughness they need, yeah. and they're going to run the ball with that toughness, right? So there are going to be a lot of changes in term, terms of how they view their personnel because, you know, and Telesco is going to benefit. He's going to take a lot of those guys with him probably to Oakland, to Las Vegas. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a fun 2024 for the Los Angeles Chargers, but we have a fun week ahead for us here with the Super Bowl. We'll get into the coordinator match. We'll talk to a lot of coaches. We'll discuss the coordinators in this big game coming up on the other side of the break, as well as the coach, Bill Belichick, who it looks like he's going to be on the outside looking in 
here for 2024, but he, he penned a letter yeah. to the New England fan base, the Boston fans. We'll break that down coming up on the other side. What a run it was for Belichick in New England. Six Super Bowls, and he went ahead and wanted to thank one of the best cities in America when it comes to sports fans. So we'll get into that on the other side, but we're going to take a quick break here. This is the GM Shuffle on the DraftKings Network. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Bill Belichick, he's a coach that's really familiar with Super Bowl week. He won yeah. six of them up in New England. <laughs> not good know? enough for the Falcons, though. <laughs> no, they, Why would they want that? <laughs> he won one in Atlanta, though, but, hey, but not well, good enough. Well, I mean, <laughs> I could see staying with McKay and working his – I love how they said McKay's not going to be involved. He's been the consigliere for 23 freaking years to Arthur Blank. What are they going to do, put him in a box? Yeah, there was a Twilight Zone <laughs> episode once that said, you know, they, they had this guy. They, they said, we'll pay you a million dollars if you can not talk for a year. And they put him in this glass case, you know, yep. and they put him in there and so they could monitor that he would not say a word because he was always always talking and so after the year was up they let him out and they don't have the money to pay him and they find out he cut his vocal cords so he wouldn't talk right <laughs> which is but like how like you think for one minute mckay's not going to call up they're not going to have conversation yeah. you, you know this is so naive on the people he's not going to be involved he, the, arthur said he's not going to be involved so, well, why would they want that? Why would they yeah. want that? Why would you want it? <laughs> I'm sure McKay's voice will be heard down there in Atlanta. Oh, of course. <laughs> a time and, or well, two. it should. I mean, they've yeah. been so successful. I mean, why wouldn't they be? Who could, who could duplicate the seven win seasons in three straight years? Yeah. But, well, uh, that was all Arthur Smith's fault. You missed it. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Good luck, Pittsburgh. Uh, but Bill Belichick, though, did pen the letter to the fans of New England, the fans in the Boston area after 24 years. This was in the Sunday paper of the Boston Globe. And, he said this, we have pulled some of the quotes that are just kind of giving his appreciation to that fan right. base. He said, quote, nowhere in America are pro sports fans as passionate as in New England. And for 24 years, I was blessed to feel your passion and power. Uh, six times they obviously had the parades, Super Bowl championships. And what a run it was. And it's kind of cool of Belichick to go ahead and thank the fan he base. That obviously he's very passionate about oh, that. Yeah. And he gave them a lot of great memories. I mean, you know, that's who he is. I mean, he's very appreciative. He understands the history. He understands the impact of the team. You know, and what what all went down there, and and you know, I keep kidding about Atlanta, but I think what, really what this comes down to is, as we talked about this collaboration, you know, is really what what happens is in collaboration is people want that in the league. They want everybody to feel involved, and the reason why Belichick isn't on coaching a team is because when you have this collaborative mentality, right, what we call group attribution, right, where everybody has a role, right. Mm -hmm. The group attribution really there's a there's a there's a bias called group at attribution error. Whereas what what happens is not everybody is equally knowledgeable. Okay, so even though you want to bring the wisdom of the crowds together, mm -hmm. it just doesn't work. And there was a a guy who is a, a, an English writer named David Tammet, you know, because he says that basically when you're pooling knowledge, the problem is you have less knowledgeable people within the system. And so what the Falcons are trying to do is, is they did not want to bring somebody with elite knowledge because it would drown out the people that didn't have it. Know. And so when you say, are you power hungry? You know, Belichick, he wants to control. Well, no, his knowledge is what gives him control because who's going to challenge that? And, mm -hmm. and the problem is when you want a collaborative effort, you have to build a pyramid. So you have to have information that starts and works its way up. And the way you gain more influence is by having the best information. And so when you say everybody's involved, who sorts the data? Who says who has the right data? Who says this? You know, why would we pick Robinson? Well, Arthur Smith wants Robinson. Well, what does Fontenot want? Well, he thinks that that's going to make a difference. Like, it, it, it all comes down to that. And so this collaboration where the air comes into is the fact that not everybody's on the same level of intellect, right? Mm -hmm. And the information has to flow upward. It can't flow downward. And so the Falcons don't hire Belichick because they're afraid the information is going to flow downward. And the information flowing upward clearly wasn't going to be good enough. So it really comes down to that. And people's misinterpretation of collaboration, mm. to me, is one of the biggest faults in the league. You know, and that's why I go back to, to the fact that you've got to have somebody who can sort through the data. Like, I never thought that if I gave Coach Walsh good information, he would make a bad decision. I could only give him bad information. And we got screwed on this with, with steroids, you know. He sent me to the library in 86, 
to go to a project because there's no internet, right? Mm-hmm. You know, go write me a report like I was in school. I was going to say, <laughs> research paper. On, on steroids. He wanted to learn about steroids. He didn't know enough about them. He wanted to know what it would look like. There was a defensive lineman from Boston College, uh, Mike Ruth, who was, you know, this incredibly built guy. But clearly, I don't want to accuse anybody, but clearly – he met all the criteria of somebody who did. And when you go through all the biggest mistakes in the draft, 90% of them come down to steroids that we don't know. And we weren't testing for steroids at that time. And so for me, when I was writing that report, it was important for me, if I gave him the right information, he would make the right decision. And we didn't. We drafted a kid, a guard out of USC uh, named Jeff Briegel, who was looked like he was going to be a great player. But once we got them and they started putting rules in place, it wasn't the same. Mm. So, you know, to me, that's where collaboration runs into a snag. If, if the people giving the information to the decision maker aren't elite, then you're not going to make an elite decision. Well, it's interesting because with Belichick, the pushback from a lot of people that say, that, oh, yeah, like we're glad we didn't bring him on is that we don't want to give him personnel control. Yeah. Look at his past drafts of the last four or five years. We don't want that. Like we just want him to coach. We don't want to give him personnel control. But then, like, as you've said, Who's going to go up there and tell him, hey, we should get this guy over that guy? Because who has that football acumen? Yeah, like, well, they like, played, they didn't, you know, when they won all those Super Bowls, you know, they, they were just, they were playing with nobody out there. I mean, Brady was doing everything. So why would they? I forgot that. Yeah. You forgot that. I, forgot. I mean, like, all, that, you win six Super Bowls with no talent, right? Yep. I mean, seriously. Did they blow drafts draft picks? Were, drafts were horrible. I, I mean, did you, did they blow draft picks? I mean, let me ask you this question. This 49ers, Adam Peters just got. This big job with yeah. the uh, with the he, commanders with the yeah. commanders, right? I mean, have, have you gone through his O two draft? Have uh, you have you gone through that O two draft? I have not. All right. I mean, if they don't, if they do not draft, if they do not draft Brock Purdy in the in the seventh round, that draft's a bomb. The Jackson, the defensive lineman, have you heard? He's on IR. He hadn't done anything. I mean, so it's like comical how people just attack. How about the Chiefs? You know, the Chiefs have, have had moments. Now, the Chiefs have always been, and I've broken down all these Final Four teams. The Chiefs have had moments where they've taken risk on character players, yep. and they've hit. And that's really been where they've gotten above. So this whole the critique of the drafts is somewhat comical, especially when you realize that Brady did all of it. He intercepted the pass that Ty Law did. That was an imagination. Yeah. That was Brady intercepting yep. that. The 13-3 to game. You know, that was all that. So yep. it's just people. Brady, Brady picked off Russell Wilson at the end of 49. Exactly. That's right. And you he knew all that. It's, Even though Brady was on the sideline jumping up and down like I was. <laughs> it's funny how that all works out. But and, and you mentioned, like, the Chiefs and what they did kind of to spin it forward to this year. They've taken chances on some character guys. I mean, we talked about Tyreek Hill out of Oklahoma State. A lot of people, like, there was some character issues there. Even Travis Kelsey, who it's like, like he's having the moment of his lifetime this season with what he's doing yep. off the field and what they're doing in this playoff run. That was a guy I remember back following that 2013 draft. A lot of people weren't really talking. It was more of the Ertz and the Eiferts oh, and yeah. those guys. Like nobody was really talking about Travis Kelsey because there were the concerns back at Cincinnati. I mean, they signed Frank Clark, who Seattle didn't want because of they off did. the field stuff, yeah. right? Kareem Hunt, he was no, yeah. he was no guy. I mean, Chris nope. Jones. The only reason Chris Jones goes in the second round is because of that. So look, give them credit. They manage it. They understand it. But you know, look. When they turned the Tyree Kill card in, and my jaw dropped because everybody knew he was a great player. Now, he was a running back. He wasn't a receiver. Mm-hmm. They made him into the slot receiver, so give Andy credit. But that, to me, and, and they've been able to do that. Now, they have not gotten – one of the things that's funny about all these teams that say you got to draft a receiver in the first round, Andy hasn't really put any resources in the number one receiver. He's been able to find them along the way. Mm-hmm. You know, He's been trying to build offensive and defensive alignment or draft a corner. Whereas, and you look at, you look at uh, like, if you go to San Francisco in this draft, I mean, that 0-2 draft, you know, I mean, they, they, they've gotten, they got Banks, Hufanga, they got Lenore, Purdy, and Buford. Those are the f- five guys in the last three drafts. Now, Purdy's, the, they get a three-run homer, yep. right? What the Niners do is they fill in the blanks when they screw up the draft. I mean, but when you go through the 0-2 draft, okay, Drake Johnson, Tyrone Davis-Price, Third I haven't, round. I haven't heard from him. He's. I think he's not on the team anymore. Danny Gray, wide receiver from Southern Miss. Have you ever heard from him? Nope. I don't know Danny Gray, right? Spencer Buford starts. Samuel Warmack. I mean, Kalal Davis, a defensive tackle from Central Florida. Have you heard of him? Nope. Okay, Brock Purdy. You know, there you go. Yeah, last all right. pick of the draft. Last nice pick. I mean, oh, 21, you get Trey Lance. You give up all those picks for Lance. And then you get Aaron Banks, yeah. the center, who plays in there. Not very well, by the way. They take advantage of banks, right? How about Trey Sermon? And he's out of the league. So it's all about, like, oh, Belichick can't draft. When's somebody going to say John Lynch can't draft? 
Oh, well, well, he doesn't draft. Or somebody said, Kyle, like it's a joke. Like they have a good team. It, it's yeah. not all related to the draft. It's related to building the team. But who's going to pay attention to that? Seriously. Yeah. And, and also drafting is hard. Like it's an inexact science. And there's been many of players that we've all loved pre-draft to where it's like it comes to the NFL, doesn't really work out. And you, you have to move on. I mean, you saw, you, you, you've saved all the mock drafts that had Mitch Trubisky oh, consensus QB1. You want to go through that? How about all the mock drafts in January? Those are the ones I love going back. We should like, – like, I'll get them out of my one note. Like, we should go through all those. Those are the best. Who's going in the first pick? Who's the number one guy? I love all those. And, and look, I'm saying this because we all screw it up. Yeah, like, we all do. You can go through all your drafts. I mean, you can go through – look, when they traded – when they traded uh, – when they traded uh, the 49ers in 20 – when they traded away uh, Buckner to Indianapolis for, and then they drafted Kinlaw in that spot. Kinlaw has not been as good as Buckner ever was, nope. right? I mean, so they real uh, now what they got away from was a smart. I thought it was a smart move. It was the money. Look, Bosa second pick overall, Debo thirty six pick overall. Like when they've lost, they've hit on some really good players. I mean, yeah. Solomon Thomas was not a hit. No, I mean that's the Mahomes draft. Yep. It's it's right there, and now he's a rotational defensive lineman for the New York Jets. It's yeah. Well, they're doing wonderful, by the way. Have you heard about that? <laughs> Run it back, twenty twenty four. Why wouldn't you? I mean, I think. How about the article in the Athletic? Did I, you see that? I, I read that one. Wow. Loaded. Hey, loaded but I would say, as stuff. a Jet fan, and when I read that article, I would say that just confirms we need Robert back. You know what's in? Nobody brought it up. Nobody brought it up, and I can't prove it. I cannot prove it. But they fired us. They fired the assistant personnel director. Two days after that column, uh, Rex Hogan, I believe his name was, mm. and they swore there was a leak in the building. Sala was asking. And nobody, article. and nobody, now I don't know if Hogan got fired for it. I'm not accusing anybody, mm. but I'm, you don't have to be Rockford here to figure out maybe there's a connection. I don't know. Let me get my trailer. Let me go sit on the ocean. Let me get my Camaro. Uh, 200 a day plus expenses, by the way. I mean, I'm just saying. It was something in there. There's a part. For, for One guy got fired. They knew there was a leak in the building. There was a mole. Now, good thing, you know, I mean, in, in the mafia and in the, you know, they usually yeah. murder those they usually, people. Yeah, they whack you. They, they whack you. But this was a different kind of whack. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what happened to Big Pussy, you know. You just get, you, you get whacked if, you, if, you, if you're wired for sound. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Exactly. He's there, wired for sound. There, there was but, did they think they took sound. Hogan out on a boat? <laughs> did they? I would like. <laughs> I mean, like somebody's not asked the question. Somebody, somebody, yeah, somebody has, has to ask we got, it. We got to figure it out. <laughs> we got to figure out what's going on there at w one jet drive. But I guess that's a story for 2024. We'll discuss the coaching battles, also the quarterback battles on the other side of here. Super Bowl 58 early breakdown here on the GM Shuffle. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. All right, let's get to the nitty gritty here of yeah. Super Bowl 58, the coaching battle. This has been a big coaching theme on the podcast yeah. today. We'll get into some more of the specifics of the props and, the, and what we like in the actual game coming up on Sunday on the Thursday pod. But the two head coaches, Andy Reid, Kyle Shanahan. Andy Reid now going for a third Super Bowl, what that would do for his legacy, and Kyle Shanahan is in pursuit of Super Bowl number one, the one that got away in Super Bowl 54 against this very team. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, Kyle grew up around this, right? So and I think Mike's been a vital part of, I mean, he's got a good consigliere, right? I mean, yeah, you one know, of the best. One of, you know, I know Atlanta has theirs, but he has a really good one there in Mike, and he can bounce ideas off of them and, and do all that. So uh, for me, you know, I think this is, the game is the strategy of the game is going to be really what, what matters. And this is what I think we miss so much in the NFL is we talk so much about tactical. You know, what you play, what you do is what Andy Reid has done over the last four weeks, five weeks of the season in terms of changing what they do offensively. You know, we mentioned the Pacheco's carries going up from 14 to 21. What Andy has been able to do is change strategy too. He's played a different game. He said, look, the strength of my team is the defense. And if I don't turn this thing over and I have been efficient and effective and Patrick protects the football, we're going to be in the game to the end, right? And I think that strategy has been really good. And then the tactics of executing that strategy in terms of running option routes, running the old West Coast offense, mm -hmm. you know, still trying to be creative, but also understanding that, you know, like we can't give this game away. Like we're going to play it. They scored 27 points in 22 minutes against Buffalo. 
Buffalo had five drives in that game of over 12 plays, maybe 11, 11, over 11. Yeah. The last drive was 16 plays, and they kicked, missed the field goal, right? So, like, they've played perfectly from a strategy, from a strategy standpoint. My issue is I, I think Kyle, they both have to play a similar strategy. I think Kyle's got to be the one to borrow from the Buffalo game plan and, fi- and control the football for an extended period of time. I think that's going to be the key to the game, and how they strategize that, how they implement that is going to be really important. You mentioned on Andy's side and what they've done with this kind of shift in their offense. That sets up pretty well with this matchup against Steve Wilkes and this Niners defense, right? Like leaning on Pacheco, going to more of the traditional West Coast game. They're kind of the quick stuff, get Mahomes a lot of completions. You think that sets up pretty well for them on Sunday? Yeah, and I think, I think Wilkes has got to do something that they haven't prepared for, whether it's a five-man line to start the game out with, whether it's a different front, because if Andy knows they're going to be in that over front, you know, and they're going to be in this coverage, then he's going to have – that script is going to be really hard for him to defend. But if I think if Wilkes comes out and plays the unconventional swordsman, you know, the great line by Mark Twain that he says, the, you know, the greatest swordsman in the world doesn't fear the second best swordsman. He fears the unconventional yep. swordsman. I think Wilkes has got to be unconventional. I think he's got to come out in a different front it's going to go against the grain of what they do, but it really doesn't. Does he play a five-man line? Does he play a different front to really create some, to get that script off scripted? That's going to be the key to the game because if Andy comes out with that script like he did against Baltimore, like he's done in every game, you know, and he can get the lead, then it's going to be really hard for the 49ers. They've started too slow. And again, I think we have to go back to where these head coaches have to have a, because they've been in this game before, Brady would talk a lot about it to our team in New England about the the how hard it is to to get into a rhythm when there's no rhythm in the game, hmm. right? There's so many timeouts, there's so long breaks, the halftime. Yeah, halftime's like 35 minutes. There's no whatever. rhythm to the game. It's all just constant, you know. Yep. And I think that's that's going to be the real challenging part for me is how do they get into that rhythm? How do they do that? And if they get behind and they don't do something on that script, if Wilkes comes out and says, okay, this is who we are, I am what I am, and he Popeyes it, you know, then they're going to move the ball right down the field on his ass. Yeah, got to get it a little bit innovative and throw some off-speed pitches, essentially. I mean, They're going to have to. You were crediting Aaron Glenn for doing that in the NFC title game and kind of yeah. just loading up that line of scrimmage and said, hey, we're going to push your guards right in the park. And it, it, it worked for a while, and it did. He really he got him to punt. He got the lead 14 to nothing. You know, and and it works. So I think to me, you, you're going to have to be a little bit of you got to think out, what, outside the box. Let's go back to the gra- the game where Brady designed the defense that won the game against the Rams. Right. If Brady played a six one front. OK, he came up with that and, and he played all seven positions of the defensive front. And so, and then he played middle linebacker too. Yes. And so he played that six one. And so, what was really what was? And I love Tom. I'm not kidding, Tom. I'm yeah. just kidding. I'm kidding everybody. Give the me narrative, the credit, yeah. right? But what that did was that forced the ball. That took away the outside zone play. Mm-hmm. And it it took away. And when he took away the outside zone, he also took away the play action pass because they wanted to run play off. And so it, McVay, who admitted after the game that he got out coached, that he got out fought by Brady, that 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 he, he was, you know, that he was, that was the unconventional swordsman. Yeah. And I think to me, that's where Wilkes has to be able to get to. One of the things that bothers me about the Niners defensively is, is they start with simplicity, which I think is really key for any coach, right? If you want to be complex, you have to start simple. So simple, they start with a basic front. New England under Belichick would always be simplistic, but touring to, depending on the game they were playing, became complex. You can't be complex and go to simple. You can only be simple to go to complex. So I think they have to move the, into something different here. Like they've got to take the Belichickian approach of what he did with the Rams or else that script, that script is going to be really hard for him to beat because if he thinks he's going to spot drop and zone and they're going to give him Y stick and Y option and empty and then his empty check is going to be this, that's exactly what they did to Baltimore. And then when Baltimore went a little more unconventional mm-hmm. is when Baltimore kind of got control of the game. So that, to me, the Wilkes battle between Wilkes and Andy is going to be the key one. And it's really on Wilkes to be a little bit unconventional. And I think he, Steve's background in, is different than just the, the Pete Carroll cover three system. Mm-hmm. Steve kind of comes from a different background. 
And I think it's going to be, if they win the game, I think it's going to be because Wilkes played really, Wilkes prepared this team really well. What about the other side of it? Can Steve Spagnola, isn't it a little bit harder to be unconventional against everything that the Niners do, all the versatility with McCaffrey and Debo and Ayuk? Like, can you be unconventional against that, or are you just trying to figure out all the stuff that they have because they are so multiple? I think what, what, what New England, what, the, what uh, San Francisco has to do is kind of get into a formation to where it forces Steve to have to recheck and reload his front and do some things. And, and I think ultimately that's where Kyle's really good. One of the things when you played against his father and you played against Kyle is there's always there's three new formations. They're never new plays. They're always new formations. And the formations are just not, are not random. The formations are there to challenge the run force, to challenge the coverage, to challenge where he wants to set it up. And then the movement, just the shift, it, it does that. So for me, I, I think, and I want to also say this too about the – about I think Steve Wilkes will rely. I think Mike Shanahan, Kyle's dad, is really good at defensive acumen. Like like one of the things that make Mike made Mike Shanahan a Hall of Fame coach, which he belongs to the Hall of Fame, is his ability to break down the defense. Very Belichickian. That's where Bill's very good. Understanding the rules in the defense, understanding the checks in the defense, and understanding how they want to attack. And and that's what he taught Kyle at a young age. And that's why Kyle's so good. That's why McVay's so good. That's why Josh McDaniels is an offensive player. That's why those guys are very good because they can do that. Now, to me, Wilkes can use that that help from Mike as he as he tries to help against Andy in the West Coast. I think that's going to be really the key. I think Mike will be not that Mike's working on this thing, but who wouldn't listen to Mike at this point? Yeah. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want to listen to Mike? Because Mike's trust me, Mike's a creature. He he may play a lot of golf, but he's watching tape too. Yeah. You know, what I mean. You know, once you're a carpenter, you ain't never losing your hammer. Yeah, yeah. He, I'm sure he's been grinding the tape and kind of giving Kyle some pointers here and there. And that's the thing that, like, when people talk about Shanahan and that offense and the McVeighs, it's like they understand the defensive rules. Like you're just talking about, like they're calling up plays to challenge those rules and put defenders in kind of compromised situations. And that's why their offenses have so much success there. I, I can't wait to see how these matchups kind of play out on the field yeah. coming up on Sunday. And we'll break into the props coming up on Thursday's podcast. But real quick with the quarterback props. Brock Purdy, his pass yards is at 245 and a half. Mahomes is at 259 and a half. We haven't seen the Mahomes like 300 yard kind of game, like those big sort of games, because it's been more efficient. From Purdy, the early starts of these games, it's been a little bit shaky, but in the fourth quarter, he's been able to make the plays that ultimately get them to win. Can Purdy do that in this game against this Chiefs defense? I think a lot of it's going to come down to can they block him up front? I think this is more about the 49er offensive front, offensive line versus Chris Jones and the boys over yeah. there. I think that's really the key because if you watch that Detroit tape, Detroit kicked their ass up yeah. front. Those guards are the weakness. Those guards are the weakness, you know. And so I think that's going to be really the key to the game. And go back to the last time they played in that Super Bowl, right? I mean, they have a 10-point lead. Tyreek Hill makes that ridiculous play on third and 18. I mean, it was ridiculous, right? And then they get the pass interference in the end zone, and then they come back. And now it's a three-point game, and they got a, I think it was a third and 10, and Chris Jones just powers the guard back. and. He's in Garoppolo's face. Of course, everybody blames Garoppolo for the throw, but it was the guard in his face. I yeah. mean, not that I'm not defending Garoppolo, but it's a combination. It's the effect. That's going to be the key. That's what happened to Purdy on the first interception. I mean, he got guy right in his face, and the guy gets his hand. To me, that's the game. That's the game. If Kyle can't figure out, if they can't figure out how to handle that or play better up front in both lines, the strength of the 49ers is what? Their defensive front. What's yep. been the weakness in the playoffs? Their defensive front. The strength of their offense is their ability to pass, protect, and run block. That hasn't been always the case. So their lines have got to play incredibly better for them to win. Yeah, and both teams were able to arrive last night. We saw the videos of the teams coming off of the planes. It's officially Super Bowl week. Yeah. We've got the practice. They're out in Lake Las Vegas. They're away from Where all is the Lake Las Vegas? I believe it's about 20 minutes outside of town. If wow. you got, if you got, so it's, it's a little bit away from the festivities and all that, which is probably for the better. But then <laughs> they got to the, drive in. I can, I, you know what I can't imagine? This is where the world has changed completely for me. There's no way Al Davis would let the Kansas City Chiefs in his facility. There's just no freaking way he would have done that. There's no way. I know that man too well. Like, there's no way he would want to see any red. Now, he would have taken no problem. He would have let the 49ers Niners, come in. Come on okay, in. Come on in. You can have their. But you telling me you're going to bring Lamar Hunt's team into my facility? You know, what people don't realize about this, and I wrote about this in Gridiron and in, in Football Done Right, is Lamar and Tex Ram were at Love Field negotiating the settlement for the AFL-NFL merger. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Al was signing players to future contracts because the Bills signed 
uh, the Bills signed Charlie Go, uh, the Giants signed Charlie Gogolak, the kicker, mm-hmm. and they violated the rule that they had between the two leagues. And that's and, what kickstarted. And all that's what kicks off. And Al yeah. signed and Roman Gabriel. He signed and John Hadle to these future ridiculous contracts, and he had no idea Lamar was over there doing this deal. And and so there's a rivalry naturally, but there is more to it than yeah. that. And to think that he's letting that team in his facility? Are you kidding me? I can't even believe it. You're going to see the Chiefs guys out there in Henderson. It just shows you we have no, we pay no attention There's to the no history, history of the no game. History. No history. But we'll have all week to meet up with all these people since it's an NFL convention here at Radio Row. This is going to be a whole lot of fun. I'm sure you're going to be on the restaurant tour this week. No, I, well, a few be, days, but few I'm going to go to Sinatra's for sure, and I'm going to go, go to Barry's. Feel so, Parmesan. There you go. <laughs> we'll do it up. All right, that does it. We'll see you guys on Thursday.